Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Marilyn Strickland, and I am a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 10th Congressional District of Washington State. And although we're still stuck at home with COVID, I wanted to do something to celebrate Black History Month, but also reach out to folks. And so even if you live in the district or if you don't, thank you for being here tonight. And today, I'm very excited to be here because I am with my friend and mentor, Merritt D. Long, and Merritt is now a published author. And he has written a book called My View from the Back of the Bus. And I remember when you told me about this book and you and your wife, Marcia, told me that this has been in the long, it's been in the making for a very long time. Right. And people often say to you, you should write a book. So you did. <laughs> and right, so right. the first thing, the first thing I want to do is just ask you, you know, what inspired you to write this book? Why did why now and why did you decide that this was a time to write your memoir? Okay. Well, thank you. And uh good morning to you, Congresswoman Strickland. Thank you. It's a real treat to, to be here and honor. And uh you are one of my uh mentors and North Stars as well. So again, thank you so much. Um uh, the reason I decided to write this memoir over 15 years ago when i was the director of the state lottery i was invited by staff at the washington state liquor control board to make a presentation during black history month and as opposed to writing about um, a major civil rights human rights african-american figure I thought, why not share some of my experience, specifically uh, growing up in the segregated South? And what immediately came to mind was my first bus ride. Um, so that started 15 years ago with stops and starts, but in the last five years became very serious about it. And when the pandemic hit about a year or so ago, I had no excuses to not finish it. <laughs> so that was one of the pluses of the pandemic, but that's how long um, I've been working on it. Uh, and fortunately, uh, my uh, uh, lifelong partner and best friend, girlfriend, uh, Marsha Tadano Long, uh, was instrumental in getting the book published, which is another whole ball game that we might come back to later. Um, and then in terms of why, initially, I thought it would be from a legacy, from a historical point of view for our daughter, our son, uh, our grandkids, nieces, nephews, great nieces, et cetera, uh, for them to see through my eyes a firsthand, my firsthand experience of growing up in the segregated South and what that was like. But after during my first vignette, I realized that it was a bigger story than just a historical reference. And now we have my view from the back of the bus. Well, great, Merritt. It's really nice to hear you describe what motivated you. And I tell people that, you know, when we think about the civil rights movement in 2021, and, you know, we meet people like you and Marsha, we sometimes forget that those things happen in your lifetime. Right. And you experience them in yourselves. Right. And, you know, I tell the story of being a baby coming to the South with my parents and my father wearing his army uniform, driving around all night long with his Korean wife and their baby daughter, not right. finding a motel room. And so the experience, even though I don't remember it, is still real. And for those of you who do not know Merritt, you should get to know him. He is a longtime resident of Olympia. He grew up, as he said, in the segregated South. He is a graduate of Morehouse College. He is a member of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, and we'll come back to that. And he's been a longtime public servant holding different positions in government. And you know, now that he has written the book, I just thought it was so important for us to hear his story and to talk about it. And I'm gonna ask him to do, you know, some readings as well. And so I want to start with, you know, we talked about um, in chapter seven on page 17, the back of the bus. You know, you talked about writing this at the Liquor Control Board, and this is really a good introduction that just talks about the Jim Crow laws that existed. 
And at the time, you know, you were only five years old, but I'd right. like to maybe ask you to read an excerpt because I know that if we were not in the middle of COVID, you'd be on a tour right now <laughs> at bookstores <laughs> across the Northwest reading excerpts. And so would okay. you share, share a bit? Oh, I'd love to. And, and it's so fitting because as I mentioned earlier, um, that particular vignette is really the pillar. Uh, it's the starting point, it's the bridge, it's the thread for the entire book. Because if I hadn't written that particular piece, I don't know whether or not I would have written the book. Uh, so it is indeed one of my favorite pieces. The white bus driver opened the door. We climbed the three steps to where the bus driver sat stiff in his seat, not bothering to nod or smile, hello. My mother deposited three quarters for our bus fare. It was my brother, my mother and I were the three passengers. The bus driver simply shut the door behind us and started driving down the avenue. Who cared about the silent bus driver? Not me, because I was taking my first bus ride to that faraway land of Birmingham. I felt 10 feet tall. I started moving toward a vacant row of seats. I immediately felt my mom tense up. She quickly grabbed my brother and me by the hand, leading us to the back of the bus. I glanced around wondering what was wrong with the row of seats I initially considered? Were they broken? Were they dirty? What was wrong with these seats in the front of the bus? No one was sitting there. They seemed okay to me. As we moved to the back of the bus, I saw a sign separating one section of the seats from the other. The wooden sign we passed as we headed to the back of the bus said colored. It looked like the word colored had been burned into the wood with tinges and specks of black and brown. After sitting down, I noticed that all the white people on the bus sat toward the front and the colored sign was behind them. As the bus traveled away from our neighborhood, more and more white passengers got on. So many white people boarded the bus, the bus driver pulled over and stopped. He got up from his seat, removed the wooden colored sign and placed it several rows further to the back of the bus, allowing white riders to sit, but forcing black riders to, to stand. Mm. My five-year-old eyes noticed an elderly black man who looked frail and not in the best of health. As he stood and held on to the overhead bar for support, he swayed back and forth until it seemed he would fall. Then he would catch himself. My gaze would follow him each time he swayed only to stop just before he fell as though I had some magical powers that could protect him from collapsing. For no apparent reason, the bus driver started driving really fast like he decided to have some cruel and unusual fun intentionally hitting bumps so the black riders would bounce around like bowling balls. For a split second, the back of the bus became heavy with despair and hopelessness, which was apparent by the number of downcast eyes. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the frail elderly man yelled out with a voice of authority, do not pay us no never mind. Don't worry about going fast. There's no one back here. There's no one back here. The bus went silent. We were all suspended in time. The frail elderly truth teller had expressed the indignity of the moment. My self-respect returned and judging by the faces of every black person on the bus, so had theirs. It didn't matter that we sat in the back of the bus. Surprisingly, after the elderly gentleman called out the bus driver, he slowed down. For the remaining trip, the bus with his black and white passengers stayed quiet. The silence rang out loud and true. 
When we arrived in Birmingham, the whites exited the bus through the front door and the blacks exited through the back door. Two races from the same town lived and moved in and out of the city through different doors and different windows. We live two different lives, one white, one color. Wow, I could visualize that as you read it. <laughs> like it was a story in a movie. And thank you for sharing that experience with us. And it was tragic, but at the same time, just honest and real about what you had to deal with. And, and so, Congresswoman, can I just share something with you on this? Because yes. the, 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 the beauty of where I am now with the book, I call it, I'm on the other side of the book. Right. As opposed to developing, working, working in the book. And about what does that mean exactly? What it means is that I am now reflecting and learning from what I had written that I didn't realize had had an impact on me until now. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting the residue, the residual of my work. With, and here's an example with the elderly gentleman. And I call him now my lion, the person that I thought, everybody thought was a frailest person on the bus. <laughs> right. Okay. He's the guy who stood up and, and called out the bus driver. He couldn't change the situation, Marilyn. Right. Congresswoman, but he could express his indignities with how we were being treated and let the person know that. And as I think about my history and, and, and my growing up, I think that's one of the first times I witnessed someone stand up for themselves that way and voice their displeasure with what was going on. And I think that was a seed that was planted within me then that has continued to grow as I have grown and through my life. And I definitely would not have realized that unless I'd gone through this process. You know, and communicating. It, no, no, it, it completely makes sense. And sometimes you look back on experiences and when you think about them and you see them through different lenses at different points in your life, they have an impact on you. And think about the risk that the man took at that time during that period and what the possible consequences were. But he spoke up and everyone just, the silence, said more than mm -hmm. anyone's words did because he shut everyone up. So I want, to, I want to talk a bit about, there's a part I read in your book that just really stuck with me. And you know, your mother plays a big role in the storytelling here. And you tell the story about going to school for the first time and right. how you had to cross a narrow bridge that was a little scary to you. And your mother would walk with you over that bridge. Right. But one day she had to say to you, son, you have to handle this yourself. So would you tell us a bit about getting walked over that bridge to school and then describe the building that was your school when you first started school, Merit? Okay, okay. Now there's two, two things here. This particular bridge and school was the uh, kindergarten, which was in uh, a separate building adjacent to someone's home. And the school, uh, which I describe in the book is a older dilapidated building but I'll, I'll do the walk across the bridge first. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, as you can see, I'm smiling, just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, because it was a very special time for me to have my mother all by myself. That's right, all to yourself. <laughs> I didn't have to compete with my brother, my father, or anyone else. Yeah. Uh, and she would walk me, I must have been four uh, plus uh, to kindergarten. And on the way to kindergarten, that was this bridge that you spoke of. There was a little brook or stream underneath. And I've always been afraid of heights. <laughs> so it didn't help that it was maybe eight feet below. Yeah. Uh, so I did not want to walk across that bridge by myself. And for the first three, four, five times, she would literally hold my hand. We walk across the bridge. Once we got across, then she would watch me walk and enter the kindergarten door. And, and one day as we were going about our business of my going to kindergarten with no uh, heads up, with no <laughs> pre pre warning that you're gonna be walking that bridge by yourself. Uh, she said, okay, you can do it, get across that bridge. So I feel like I was having to walk the plank, okay? 
<laughs> so I uh, slowly, carefully made it across the bridge by myself. Yeah. And then when I got to the other side of the bridge, previously, whenever I looked back, she would still be standing there watching me go into the classroom. That particular day when I turned around, she was on her way. I was on my own. <laughs> I didn't have my protector with me anymore. So um, it, it, it had a lot of symbolism to it in the sense of being on your own and fending for yourself, uh, overcoming your fears. Uh, so it was a very special uh, time uh, and a very special time going across a bridge until that one day. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I, I, you know, I keep coming to stories in this book about your childhood just because they're so poignant and they just really just, they, they just made such an impression on me, Merritt. You know, and you talked about living in your house and having an ice box. And right. for those of you who don't know this, you literally had a box with a big old block of ice to keep your food cold and safe. That's right. And you tell the story about your father walking up this hill to get this block of ice and coming home. So could you share with our listeners and viewers very briefly, just that story about your dad dad being a man of strength and he didn't say a whole lot but he still worked hard for his family uh thank you yes um for some reason on on three or four occasions i would walk with my father from where we lived uh at that time on uh, gladstone gladstone alley to the brickyard hill where the uh, uh ice house was located uh so we would go and walk to the hill and he would have what we call a gunny sack mm -hmm. um brownish beige back uh cloth bag and um, put it on the deck uh, and stand in front of the gentlemen who were pulling the ice out of the ice house with these pliers type uh, instrument and put it in the bag and he put two, three of those in the bag. And my father would uh, pick the bag up, swing it, put it over his shoulder, and we'd walk home with the ice. Marilyn, how much do you think each block of ice weighed? I'd say at least 10 pounds. Yeah. I think at least 10 pounds. So he was carrying at least 30 pounds. Uh, and uh, Marsha teases me because I don't estimate time in terms of miles or distance in terms of miles i always say well it takes about 15 minutes to go there <laughs> okay yep. so it would take about 15 minutes uh to walk from the brickyard hill to our home yeah. uh, and my father would do that very religiously uh, uh very quietly the only thing that i remember him saying to me one day was um i want to make sure that you and your brother have an opportunity to go to college so you can use your head for work and not your back. Interesting. So that's a good segue into your experience at Morehouse College. And for those of you who don't know, there is a system of historically black colleges and universities that were created. I think some of them started with the Methodist church back in the day because African-Americans were not allowed to attend universities and colleges. And so there's a system called HBCUs and you probably have heard of them. And there are some that have really risen to the top and you know Morehouse College, Spelman College, Howard University where Vice President Kamala Harris attended. I myself am a graduate of HBCU, Clark Atlanta University. And so Merritt, talk about your experience at Morehouse College. How did you get there? What was the experience? And what would you tell our listeners and viewers? Like, you know, what is so special about being an African-American and attending an HBCU? Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for, the, for that question. Uh, my brother, uh, Ken, uh, had two major influences on me. One was moving to the Northwest because when I uh, came to Seattle in 1968, I was just out of college, but uh, finding professional work in Alabama was very difficult and he thought I would have more opportunities in the Northwest. And he attended for two years Clark College. Oh, okay. And he suggested that I go to Morehouse. He thought Morehouse would be a good fit for me. And he thought I would enjoy my experience there. So Morehouse 
was the only college that I applied to. I had an application for Tuskegee, but I don't know quite what happened to it. But the reason I went to Morehouse was on my brother's recommendation. Um, the, the thing of significance for me about Morehouse and, and my daughter and, and Marshall give me a, a bad time about this because you've probably heard this Congresswoman when someone says, you know, I wrote about that and it's in my book. Well, I wrote about it and it's in my book, okay. <laughs> So let me just share with you a couple of things about that. Thank you. One of the Morehouse goals was to develop the whole man. And Morehouse, man, all male school, uh, Spelman College, our sister school, where another uh, leader currently and of the future, uh, Stacey Abrams is a Spelman uh, graduate. And I also might add uh, Senator Warnock, Reverend Warnock, is also a Morehouse grad uh, and Barack um, Sellers. Um, Bakari to, Sellers? Bakari. And I just love Bakari even before I knew he went to Morehouse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and also, uh, Congresswoman um, Samuel Jackson, who's a Morehouse grad, but he took his acting classes at. Clark College. Yes, because Clark has a very good communications program. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay, we're communicating. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Morehouse's goal was to develop the whole man, not just academically, but spiritually, physically, and socially. Morehouse was preparing us to move in any circle we, when we graduated, for we were expected to do great things mm -hmm. in the world. There are those who say, you can always tell a Morehouse man, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> okay, And I'm sure Marsha, my wife of over 40 years would wholeheartedly agree with that. Where, this, where did this notion come from Morehouse and this atmosphere of confidence that related, that to me related to being on the campus with the presence in the presence of some of the best and brightest students from across the country and the world. There was a sense of competition, not with each other. Rather, there was a feeling and belief that each of us had to strive to achieve our personal best for we would be compared to the rest of the world. Our professors pushed and challenged us by talking about the difference we could make if we applied ourselves fully, not halfway, not in between, we had to be all in. Because our professors had such high expectations for us, we believed we were special and meant to do extraordinary things. When, when I attended Morehouse at that particular time, the total student body was uh, over a thousand students. Wow from all over the country. And then secondly, currently, I think Morehouse now has about 2,000 plus students who attend. So one of the beauties of that is it's small and big enough where you get to know your classmates versus say, with all due respect to the University of Washington, 30,000 plus individuals. Right. When I came to Seattle and walked on the University of Washington campus, I literally did this because it was so big, it just kind of overwhelmed me seeing that kind of a structure. Right. So the expectations, the support, um, being around folks from all over the world, uh, marching behind the uh, band to the football games, uh, Spellman to the right, Clark to the left. You had the, some of the most talented and most attractive women in the world <laughs> in this particular center of black intelligenza you know and it's interesting too because you know i think about it's, what's, what's kind of funny here is that you know you went to morehouse and then you went to the university of washington and got shocked by the size of it i graduated from the university of washington and then a few later a few years later moved to atlanta and attended clark atlanta university and i was just smiling from ear to ear because you are there on this campus and for the first time in your life as a student, at least for me coming from the Pacific Northwest, it's like, you're not a minority. 
and you meet people from different parts of the world, as you said. I mean, I had classmates from Ghana. I had classmates from, you know, all parts of the, you know, the Black diaspora. And, and also, too, I, you know, there were quite a few Washington State license plates at the AU Center, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So talk a bit about, you know, as you think about attending the HBCU, you know, what would you say to a young person who's considering where to go to college? And I know that, you know, I, I have friends who have, you know, who have kids and they said, well, you know, they want to go here. I'm not sure about going far away from home. And everyone's experience is different. But if someone said to you, you know, Mary, why should I go to an, <clears throat> to an HBCU? What would you say to them? I'd, I'd say, um, and repeat some of the things that, that you, you just mentioned, uh, and that is being on a campus where you're not a number, you're yeah. an individual, uh, where you can develop relationships versus acquaintances, mm -hmm. uh, and being in a situation where not only do you have the academics uh, in the area, but also you are in such a historical place as like in Atlanta and these places in the South particularly are places where uh, Julian Bond as an example, when he, he's a Morehouse grad, when he first ran for uh, Congress, I happened to be a freshman at Morehouse when he was uh, speaking on campus about wow. running for the, legis for the state legislature. Uh, and uh, John Lewis, former Congressman Lewis, uh, as you know, he they started the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. King would come to campus. Um, Maynard Jackson, the former mayor uh, of Atlanta, who was very instrumental in getting the Atlanta airport built and initiating um, a program that allowed uh, Black and other businesses of color to right. participate in the um, uh, business operations of the airport. I say that to say that was just tremendous amount of opportunities and access to uh, people who have achieved and are still achieving, which means you would in turn, if you wanted to pursue that direction, whether that be city government or whether that be in the legislative arena or the private sector, there are role models there right. and, and other cities where you can emulate. So I think it's just a, a composite of all of those factors. Uh, and I think growing up for someone growing up, particularly in the Northwest, right. uh, there's just so many advantages of being in an environment where you're, you're not that person in the room. And you're not going to be that person who's called on if there's a color, particularly relating to a Black issue, right. whereas typically that's <laughs> often the case in the Northwest. You know, and the thing that I really appreciate too about being at an HBCU is that the professors represented people with a lot of different backgrounds. So I remember, you know, I had a professor who taught, um, you know, technology and his name was Dr. Kim. And he talked about his experience growing up in Korea and just the changes politically and socially. So he was a bit militant when it came to civil rights. There was a professor I had who taught math and economics and he actually attended Georgia Tech. You know, he was a white professor. Okay. And he says he remembers playing on a segregated football team when he was at Georgia Tech. And he said that he grew to appreciate the African-American community because these were his teammates and they couldn't stay in hotels when they traveled. And so they would end up staying in people's homes. And he said that that experience shaped him. And so even the depth and breadth of who you get as professors in an HBCU is pretty fascinating. So I wanna go back to something that you said your father said. And on page 71 of your book, you talk about the time your dad quit his job because mm -hmm. he was just being verbally abused at work by a supervisor. Right. He comes home, he apologizes, but I just think, you know, you talk about these instances in your book about black men just having to stand up and speak out. And so if you don't mind, could you read a bit about that particular ex excerpt and talk about racism on the job and even how we think it's 2021, but there is still implicit bias that exists. So could you read a bit from page 71? Oh, sure, sure. The sound of my father's voice was troubling that day when he came home from work at about 2 p.m. He walked into the kitchen through the back door. And as soon as he saw my mother's face, he said the following words that I never heard him say before or again. Kate, 
I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't immediately know what that meant other than it wasn't a good something. Our father had been working construction on a major housing project about a half mile from my home. This type of temporary construction job was the kind of job he was able to obtain after he'd been laid off from his permanent job at the Pullman Standard Plant of Bessemer, a company that made train boxcars. My mother was home and preparing dinner when he unexpectedly arrived home several hours earlier than usual. As he turned around to greet, as she turned around to greet my father, she saw something was wrong. Her expressive eyes looked pained and worried. I could see her asking herself before she asked him what might be wrong. Finally, she spoke, Mac, what happened? I felt uncomfortable being in the kitchen during this conversation and quietly left the area. I sat down in the living room still close by. A house was so small, which meant everything and everybody was nearby. It was about a thousand square feet with two bedrooms, dining room, living room, kitchen, bathroom, and a screen side porch. My father told my mother he'd been digging a ditch for over an hour and it seemed no matter how he dug the ditch, his white supervisor wasn't satisfied. My father was an extremely hardworking man, and he took pride in his work, regardless of the job. After a certain point, he said his supervisors started calling him names and screaming at him for no apparent reason. That August summer day was one of those days that was so hot, mothers kept their kids indoors to shield them from the scorching sun. Even the strength and durability of iron, if hammered on enough, will wear out. My mother used to say she felt our father, her husband, had reached a point where iron wears out. He saw two choices. One, knock the shit out of that name calling Peckerwood, or two, quit the job. He decided to quit and come home. I've never known my father to quit anything he tried, especially a job. His creed was, if you wanted to work, you could always find a job. It may not be the job you want, but if you wanted to work, you could always find a job. That wasn't just something he talked about. He lived this philosophy throughout his life. In the ring, in the ring of work, he'd never been knocked out and out and had to walk away from a job. In the ring of work, he'd never been knocked out and had to walk away from a job. He wasn't wired that way. Supporting his family was his paramount duty. So for him to quit a job, even under horrible circumstances, was an unspeakable act. However, his dignity had been breached. He couldn't go any further. Now he stood in his home, apologizing to his wife because he felt he had let her down. Mm -hmm. I rarely, if ever, observed moments of tenderness or physical affection between my parents. But the painfully humiliating experience for my father, ironically, led to a touching and loving moment. As I peeked around the corner, my mother was hugging my father as tears rolled down, uh, down his cheeks. She comforted him by slowly and softly saying over and over, it's okay, Matt, it's okay, Matt, it's going to be okay. I went outside in the stifling heat knowing everything was okay for me in some ways better than ever. I was so proud and happy for my mother and father doing this real life tragedy. My mother and father showed true care and affection for one another at an intense level when everything seemed so bleak, seemed so bleak. It made me feel good. How ironic and tragic that a man felt down because he'd walked away from a job as a result of verbal abuse. Even though my father was digging a trench for a construction job, he still retained his pride and sense of self. Tragic, because in addition to quitting, a word not in my father's vocabulary, he experienced the pain of letting down his family, especially his wife. Fortunately, my father's self-worth and sense of dignity 
one over personal verbal abuse at any price. If he'd stayed, if he'd stayed, I think he would have left part of himself in that three foot trench forever. I remember seeing black men similar to my father in age, education and work experience, and some appeared to have left their pride and self-respect in a ditch, trench, or the back of a garbage truck, never to be seen or heard from again. Sometimes the price of doing the right economic thing pales in comparison for the long-term psychological harm that scars one forever. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And you know, there are many layers to that vignette that you shared with us. Um, number one, that there is dignity in all work. Number two, that every person on the workplace deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. And I think about that period in America and all the workers' rights and work rules that exist today where that behavior would not be tolerated or there would be consequences for that from a supervisor. So thank you for sharing that very personal part of the story about your father. Oh, sure. So I wanna to go to um, the conversation about the experience that we have now in the 21st century when it comes to what's happening at the workplace. You know, you and Marsha have both been leaders in state government for a long time. And I know that, you know, you have, uh, you know, your daughter and your son-in-law or young people in their careers, your grandparents, but, you know, talk about what you see happening with the workplace today when it comes to some of the challenges that you've experienced over time. Because I know you've been working, you know, you've worked a lot in a lot of different areas. So just talk about, you know, workplace discrimination and, you know, what you see happening right now. Okay. Um, one of the things I uh, think about right now, um, Congresswoman uh, Strickland is, let's say the public sector, and, yeah. and we'll move to the private sector in a, in a moment. But although some of the things I'm gonna say about the public sector are analogous as well in the private sector. And, and one uh, major something is that if, if you look at an organization, uh, say of, um, let's say 200 people, uh, and you have uh, four divisions that run the organization, personnel, um, administrative services, program services, legislative affairs, and there's a director, deputy director, or special assistant, and then you have the division administrators who report up, and then one level below are the middle managers. Yeah. And my sense and my experience was there was a disproportionate number of people of color, particularly a lot of black folks at that middle management level, right. who for a number of reasons have not been able to move as quick to that next level, right. which is the administrative level. Yep. And if you're not, from my experience at the administrative level, you're not gonna go to the third, second or first level because you don't go from uh, the fourth level to the first level, right? That's not the way it works. You have to have that senior level right. experience. Now you may be in the uh, administrative level and you might be able to slingshot to the directorship if you have good experience and good contacts uh, or good right. relationships with the powers to be. So I think that's something that has, a, from my experience in government, has not changed as much as I think it should when you really look at organization and who's where and who's moving up. You know, and it's interesting, too, because you know, I think there was a point when, you know, I remember my father saying this when I was a kid, but well, so-and-so got themselves a good government job. And so at one point, the hurdle was just to even get in the door. Right. And now I think the conversation is, OK, but what opportunities are there for people to be in leadership? And right. you know, what are leaders of organizations doing to cultivate leadership and provide opportunities for people to move however they want, whether it's right. laterally or, or vertically? Um, you know, one thing I want to talk about here is, you know, you talked about workplace and opportunities. And I even think about the conversation you, we just had about your father and being abused, which was, you know, a form of workplace violence. And as everyone knows, on the 6th of January in right. this year, 
there was a violent insurrection at the US Capitol. There was a failed coup attempt by white supremacists to overturn the results of a legitimate election. And I think about the contrast of that week. I was sworn in on Sunday with the most, that Sunday with the most diverse Congress in the history of the US. Three days later, there is a Confederate flag rolling through the Capitol trying to cause an insurrection and hurt people. And then my friend and colleague, Andy Kim, who's Korean American, was photographed on the floor cleaning up after that mm -hmm. mess. And mm -hmm. you saw African Americans and people of color who work with the custodial staff cleaning up that mess. So as you think about what you saw happen in the nation's capital, you know, think about your experience growing up in Alabama, going to Morehouse, the successful career that you've had in state government. But what were you thinking when you saw that? What, what came to your mind, especially pulling back on your life experience? Okay. Well, several, several things uh, came to mind. The, the first something that came to mind, I was, I was amazed. I was just totally shocked from the anger that I could feel and sense from the rioters that day. I mean, people were coming to hurt people. I mean, it wasn't a protest no. uh, or a peaceful demonstration. Um, and then my next thought was George, former Governor George Wallace, when I saw the Confederate flag. Yeah. And I remember when I worked um, in ninth through 12th grade in, in the flower shop in Alabama and listening there one day, one of the employees talked about, I overheard her say, well, you know, the governor did everything he could. He stood in the door. He tried to keep him out, but it looks like it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, Congresswoman, I think, part of that anger, when you talked about your class being one of the most diverse classes, when we reflect on the presidency of uh, former Senator, former President Barack Obama, uh, I think those changes as they are occurring in our country, particularly for some white men, have extreme difficulty in dealing with that because I think they are visualizing themselves as being, I'm not saying it's true, but yeah. seeing themselves as being obsolete, as being not listened to, uh, as being replaced yeah. uh, by people of color. So they are threatened by that. And some react to that, especially with a bullhorn by individuals who in, incite that and, and make that situation uh, even worse. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when you watch that happen, you know, you it, it was a lot of things, but that was not economic anxiety. That was just a lot of anger. And, you know, and, and, you know, and some of the things you described about people not feeling as important anymore or not feeling as relevant. And this is not a conversation about saying that people are obsolete, but you look at the the anger that was fomented by the former president. Right. You look at how so many things that are hateful and hurtful and bigoted became normal to say right. to a lot right. of people. And so I think there was a climate that was created. And even right. Right. some of the things that you know you even hear about now where people are still buying into these bizarre conspiracy theories. So with that said, we have a we have a few minutes left. I want to wrap this up. Okay. And I think about I think about the way that you know you describe your book. So those for, so so when you get the book, you open with a pretty bold sentence and I'm gonna read it, but I'm not gonna read it verbatim. Sure. And you start out in this called prologue, I'm the one. I'm the one you called N, the N word, with relish and glee. That's how this book starts. And then at the end, when you talk about final thoughts, you talk about the pillars that your parents taught you. Treat people the way you wanna be treated. Your word is your bond. Never underestimate a person's value based on their station in life. And for me, those two phrases in the beginning and the end really just encapsulate your life story. But I want to touch on something because we talk so much about 
policing and what it's like to be a black man in America and just the tragedies we've seen happen over the last few years. Tell us about the talk. And for those of us in the black community, we know what the talk is, but will you describe for our audience, like, talk about, t tell us about what it was like to get the talk and how it felt. Sure, sure. Um, I'll, be, I'll be happy to. Um, the, excuse me for a second, let me That's just okay. pull that. And for those of you who are watching while um, Merritt finds the excerpt, um, thank you again for joining us for this Black History Month discussion. I wanted to have a discussion that got a little deeper into some issues. And I do believe that what's happening right now in this country, as we think about recovering from this pandemic, as we think about economic justice, that we have to be willing to have these conversations with open minds and open hearts and listen to people's experiences. So Merritt, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. I had it, Share with us, please. I had it tagged and everything. I, That's I, I okay. <laughs> organize myself. That's all right. <laughs> okay. And again, I'll just do excerpts. I won't read the whole thing, uh, Congresswoman. My mother's first class seminar of things to do and not to do in the white world seemed to come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Had something happened to her that day? Some slight verbal affront or disrespectful tone? Maybe she was totally ignored at the retail counter. Once, while my mother waited, the clerk continued to talk with a white acquaintance who stood there, or perhaps some white store patron in a hurry to purchase some item for her child bumped her to the side and acted as though it never happened. I knew the state of Alabama had rules, regulations, and laws, but I also knew there were unwritten rules that protected how white people treated black people. This allowed some to physically and verbally abuse black people and get away with it. When my mother spoke to me that day, the rhythm of her voice was unlike anything I had experienced before. There was tremendous sense of urgency as she began to speak. It was as if she felt she should have had this conversation with me sooner and was making up for lost time. As she bent down, she cupped my face in both of her hands and pulled me closer with our faces almost touching. This was the first and the last time she would do this. Suddenly she released my face, tapped me on both shoulders and commanded me not to slouch or stoop, especially so when talking with white people. My mother told me that whenever I went to downtown Bessemer, there were certain things I must remember and do when dealing with white people. I was about five years old at the time, and I had recently began first grade at Hart Elementary School. Her first edict involved talking with whites and to always look them directly in their eyes. By doing so, she felt I would display my lack of fear, always believe that you are as good as anyone else, no matter what people say, she said, adding, the world may seem unfair at times, but this is the way things are. She told me the only thing I had control over was how I handle myself during these situations. She said to always obey the laws because the police, the police will kill you in the blink of an eye and get away with it. Avoid them whenever possible she counseled. The seriousness of her voice has become fainter over the years in my memory, but the message remains with me and always will. The talk. The talk. Well, um, we are out of time, unfortunately, and we probably got through a third of the things I would love to discuss in this <laughs> book. But Merritt, thank you for sharing your personal story and real experiences with us during Black History Month. Um, you know, I know that you self-published and you and Marsha, you know, have this book available for people who want it. And again, the name is My View from the Back of the Bus, an inspirational memoir. Mm -hmm. And I just thank you again for sharing your story. I know that it takes years to write books and people often say, I should write a book and you did it. And I know that you had a lot of help from your fantastic life partner, Marsha Long, who is a dear friend of mine, who I love and respect. So thank you, Merritt, for sharing with us. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And again, 
There's a lot of work to do in the United States in the 21st century, but our ability to listen, to learn, to have open minds and open hearts starts right here with each person in each relationship that we have. So thank you, Merritt, so much for joining me today. Yeah. Might, might I add just one something? Of course. Congresswoman, and that is, I just wanna recognize you and to say that um, as uh, one of your constituents, two of your constituents, Marsha and I, we feel so fortunate to have you where you are right now. Timing is everything. And we feel as though this is your time. Uh, and we want you to know uh, that you have all of our support and confidence. And we look forward to all the great things that you will do in the future and whatever we can do to be supportive, you can count on it. Thank you so much. It is an honor to serve. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. Take care. Uh, thank you.